next speaker. And I shall hold everyone in contempt who said they don't miss me. Our next speaker is Aditya, who comes, uh, who's an army brat. He's done uh, nine schools in 10 years. And if life wasn't enough for the last nine months, no pun intended, he's been shuttling between Jakarta and India. He works in Gojek and uh, is living the life of a nomad. He's been a state level swimmer, but luckily he flies between Jakarta and India. <laughs> so, Aditya, all yours. Sure. Hello. Uh, hi, guys. Yeah, so as uh, Gautam mentioned, I've been working with Gojek for the last two years. I've been very lucky that I've been uh, getting to work with systems which we have to scale uh, tremendously. Uh, I mean, straight out of college, I was getting to work with these production systems, and I've learned a lot in the past two years. So just going to share my experience with you guys of how we dealt with uh, scaling up in Gojek. So yeah, so the initial title of my talk was uh, migrating from a 2000 session per second monolithic architecture. But in the last two months, we have uh, gained even more traffic due to our awesome business team. And now we have like a 3000 session per second monolithic architecture, uh, which we converted to microservices. So uh, we have like crossed like a million bookings every day. And the traffic coming on our system is tremendous right now. Okay, so I want to start by asking, like, uh, who all agrees with me that microservices is the way forward for large systems? Can you guys, like, do a show of hands? Yeah, so a good majority, and I guess the guys who are not raising their hands, I think they have something very interesting to share about not switching to microservices, or maybe they've not heard of uh, microservices. So I want to start by saying that breakdown is the law of nature. Uh, it's not just our software which needs to break down. Uh, see any example in nature, uh, it has to break down when it reaches a level which it cannot sustain. Uh, one example is the gas cloud. Uh, that's how our whole solar system was formed. Uh, once it became too huge to sustain itself, it had to break down into smaller components to stabilize. And software is no different. So uh, let me start by giving you some context about Gojek so that you can understand uh, why we had scaling issues. So this is the Gojek app. Uh, as you can see, we have a delivery system, a transport system, a food ordering system, and a, a shopping system. So uh, initially, Gojek started with a call center with just 20 uh, riders in 2010. Uh, this was a time when we didn't have an application and we used to manage using a call center-based approach. Uh, moving to 2015, we actually launched this application. We did not have a lot of customers. We just had 30,000 drivers. And uh, we were not facing any major bottlenecks on the tech because you can't have scalability problems if you don't have traffic coming to your application. Right? So to handle this uh, medium amount of traffic, we had a monolith system sitting at the back end. This monolith system was uh, handling all our services. Like, there was no segregation whatsoever. And it was doing pretty well for the, at that point of time. Uh, to give you some idea about this monolith, it's, uh, it was called Stanmarsh. And Stanmarsh was a Spring Java monolith. Uh, it had everything in itself, like authentication, order, order management, uh, driver authentication, payments, notifications. Uh, it was sitting on a MySQL DB, and it was a very huge code base. It still exists, and it's a nightmare right now to refactor. So why we started with the monolith in the first place? The thing with splitting to microservices is that you can never know from the start that you require microservices. It's only when you start getting into difficulties with your monolith is when you try to pull out a microservice. If you start initially with microservices, it's not going to work because you have no idea what kind of business requirements you'll have in the future. So the monolith in the beginning was, it's e it was easy to prototype. It had faster development. We actually had uh, business requirements coming in like crazy because we had pretty good business ideas and we wanted to try them out, experiment it. So the monolith system was serving those needs very well. 
we were able to develop very fast with the monolith system. There was just one single deploy, and there were no dependencies. So that's why the monolith was working for us. So at this point of time, our tech is doing fine, but we have very less business. So all our uh, efforts are going, to e going into increasing the business for Gojek. Luckily, in the next six months, our business increased like 600 times probably. Uh, our traffic, uh, like we had a huge customer base and our drivers were like 300,000. Uh, so you have 300,000 drivers, you have like uh, 20 million customers. The monolith is gonna crash. So we were definitely in some serious dark times. We had problems like uh, running out of the integer limit on the database. Like we didn't even uh, imagine that we could have order transactions uh, going above the integer limit. That started crashing pretty badly. Uh, the load itself was so high when we were replicating servers. Due to connection pooling, our DB was going down continuously. Uh, CPU usages was getting exhausted, which is the reason why we had to come up with uh, new servers, like keep spinning up parallel machines. And uh, since the systems were not isolated, a single uh, bug in like an isolated part of the code, for example, say notifications, was affecting our whole order management system also. This is what happens when you're not doing a microservice-based approach. Your unrelated applications can stop working just because they're in the same code base. And the deploys were taking more than an hour because we had now so many uh, app boxes so that we could handle this kind of traffic. So uh, if you guys uh, just uh, like read about uh, microservices, these were exactly the problems which microservice architecture is meant to solve. So basically we were not being able to scale up and let's just talk about what exactly scale is. So uh, someone says that scale is not about designing websites that don't crash when users increase. It's about designing your website which doesn't crash with new business requirements and when business is growing and Gojek was growing like crazy. So uh, to give you more idea about what scale exactly is, you can define scale, uh, like there's a scale cube which has three uh, components, uh, like three different types of scale that you can have. So the x-axis is the simplest kind of scaling which we were doing on a monolithic architecture which is just replicating your app boxes. But uh, that can only work up to a certain extent and like we could see it failing pretty badly. So we decided like we have to come up with a more, like a better scale solution, which was basically y-axis scaling, which is separating your uh, like domains into different kind of services, not just replicating the same logic across different machines. So to do uh, y-axis uh, scaling, uh, y-axis scaling is a kind of microservice architecture and to understand what exactly microservices are. Uh, microservices is like a specific type of decomposition. Uh, decomposition in computer science is uh, like a pretty old and well-known term. Object-oriented programming is a type of decomposition. And so is microservices. It's just like breaking down a system into smaller parts. Uh, you can manage those smaller parts well. Uh, you can isolate them, customize them, uh, rather than having a single component, which is how object-oriented programming also works. So uh, here's the difference between a microservice and a monolith. The monolith, when you need to scale it, you're doing x-axis scaling, which is basically replication of the servers. So you have the same logic in all the servers, whereas microservices is segregating the logic in your different systems, and then you could decide to scale those individual systems uh, separately. Like for example, if you have a service which is dealing only with orders, and you have a uh, service which is dealing only with customer notifications, you can decide to increase your app boxes for your order management system if you're doing a microservice architecture. But if it's a monolith, you would have to uh, increase the logic in all the boxes together. 
which is like a waste, like the notification system won't need that much resources. So you're just wasting resources. So basically the solution is that our monolith has to be rewritten into microservices. It has to evolve into a microservice architecture, but very easily said than done. And we face like some serious challenges while doing that. So just to like give an example of, uh, yeah, of a mechanical or civil engineering problem, which is probably better to visualize, uh, we have an example of a log gate system, which is used in uh, Scotland in uh, say the 1990s. So the problem with this approach is that every time you, a boat comes up to a gate, it takes like an hour for the water to level up and then the boat can go up to a higher canal from a lower canal. Uh, in a particular place in Scotland, they had to do this like 11 times for one boat to cross from one canal to the other, which was to take more than 24 hours. So, and uh, like a probable solution would be to make the uh, log gates faster or just like try to optimize that, but that wouldn't have solved the problem by a huge margin. So you had to come out with a out of box solution. So this is the uh, Falkirk wheel, which they came up with in the 2000s. It took probably like 10 years to develop this huge manpower, huge uh, amount of resources, but they could come up with an effective solution which reduced the travel time from 24 hours to 30 minutes. So we required something like this where we could come up with a creative solution to solve our unique problem. So to understand what exactly our problem was, uh, a brief overview of the architecture was like all the order management systems, food, car, bike, all of them had the same URLs and they were hitting one monolith. So there was no way to distinguish for the HA proxy to know if that URL belongs to a food service or a transport service. So like how would you uh, route those requests if you wanted to segregate a new backend for transport. You couldn't do it from an HA proxy because the HA proxy is not able to uh, like understand anything else apart from the URL. And the information of whether that request was coming from a food or car was actually stored in the request body. And that is how the apps were designed. So uh, we couldn't change the apps, of course, because old apps were still being used by the public. We had to come up with a way to actually route the request based on the request body parameters. So basically we had to come up with a smart proxy which looks beyond the URL to reroute the traffic. So this uh, smart proxy had a few challenges. It had to scan the request body. Now if you try to open a request body uh, using Golang or using any service, the file pointer would move to the end of the request body. And that means that you cannot forward that request anymore to a new backend. And also, this smart proxy would, is going to face like a huge amount of load, like, like I said in the beginning, like 3,000 sessions per second. So these were the challenges that we had, and we had to come up with this smart proxy. This is where, as you can see the red dot, that is, the, that is where the sm a smart proxy would sit in the architecture. So basically, requests which are coming from HA proxy would go to the smart proxy, and the smart proxy would then pass the request body to decide if it's a transport request, and then send it to the transport backend, and if it's not, then send it to the old monolithic backend. So like, let's jump into a bit of code, which like I tried to keep as minimal as possible, but we can't avoid it completely. So this is the starting point in the smart proxy of where the request URL comes. This is pretty similar to how you see ACLs in HA proxy. So like you have an example of a backend foo request URL coming in. And uh, through this, we are actually redirect redirecting it to a service type handler in Golang. So what exactly is this service type handler? The service type handler was taking this uh, HTTP request and it was creating a service type struct. I'll get into a bit more detail about what exactly the service type struct would do. And it was cloning the request. We need to clone the request because as I mentioned above, when we are opening the request body, the uh, file pointer goes to the end and uh, we are not able to forward that 
request body anymore. So we need to uh, have an in-memory clone of that request body, which is what the clone request functionality is doing. And uh, next thing was to uh, decode the request and send it to this service type uh, struct that we have. The service type struct had the logic to be able to open the request and decide which backend to forward that request to based on the service type. So here's the service type struct. Uh, it has a proxy function, which is where the uh, request body would come in. And as you can see, we have a simple if check to see if the service type is of car or is of bike and return a proxy depending on that. So once we have the uh, proxy uh, over here, we need to also uh, clone the request. So as you can see, cloning the request, we are taking two byte buffers and doing IO copy and rewriting the request body into both of those IO buffers and returning those IO buffers back to the service type handler. So now we have the uh, cloned request body, which we pass to the service type struct, and service type struct opens the clone of the request body and decides which service type the request belongs to. Now, as you can uh, see in the end of the service type handler, we are passing the original uh, request, and now the new uh, service type proxy to the proxy handler. So the proxy handler is uh, just taking the proxy which we passed to it. In this case, it was the service type proxy and calling a serve HTTP response and actually firing a HTTP call to that backend. So basically, uh, we are doing kind of a reverse proxy uh, approach here where this smart proxy is choosing a backend based on the URL parameters and then redirecting it to that backend. Now, how we created those backends, uh, it was using uh, this proxyable interface, and we used to create backend based on car, bike, or whatever other uh, service type we will have. And just to create that backend, we just need to pass some configuration to the reverse proxy method of uh, the HTTP util library, and we could just have the new backend running and getting the request of only car. So here, the new architecture uh, started working, and we started having uh, the go-car request going only to our new backend from the smart proxy, whereas the other service requests were going to the monolithic backend. Now, this was still a very small part of our whole uh, traffic, because car, for us, was like probably 20% of the traffic. We still had to transfer the uh, major part of traffic, which is bike traffic, about 70%. Uh, that is like a million bookings every day. And uh, we couldn't do it in one go because uh, we had no idea how this new backend will work against this amount of traffic. So the uh, design of this smart proxy enabled us to do a phased migration of the bike traffic. So first, for feature parity, we migrated a few internal customers to the new backend. To uh, migrate just these internal customers, uh, we just had to add another logic in the handler itself where it would pick out some cu customer IDs from the configuration and compare the customer ID in the request body. If the customer ID is matched, then it would go to the new backend. So this way we were able to migrate about 100 customers who were internal to Gojek to this new backend, and we were able to see the behavior and the feature parity of this backend in production. This we like kept this system we kept on for like about a couple of weeks. And once we were sure that the feature parity is met, we decided to tra migrate a part of the traffic to the new system. And that was going to be percentage based, say like 20% at one time, because you can't actually tra uh, migrate the whole 100% to the new system. You have no idea how the internal communication will work, whether the new system, the new database will be able to hand handle all those kind of load. Like, you can do load testing, but that is still isolated, right? How the whole system will react, 
you have to have some kind of uh, phased approach to transfer a small amount of traffic to the new system. So doing that also was uh, possible in the smart proxy where we uh, generated random numbers for every request. And if that random number was below a certain threshold, which we wanted to maintain for the new backend, then we would pass that request to the new backend. So this way we were able to do 20%, 30%, and in phases, increase it to 60% of the bike traffic. Once we reach 60%, we realized that uh, the interaction uh, titled payments here was breaking. Like the internal calls were not uh, able to cater to this new amount of load, even though the external calls were working. So here we realized that we needed to uh, restructure our internal communication. So we moved synchronous request to a sync request, which helped us to uh, reduce timeouts in the internal communication. And uh, then we again switched back to 60%, and this time it did not break. And once we were sure that this amount of traffic is being handled, we finally made a switch of the whole 100% on the new backend. So th the new backend now is just handling car traffic and bike traffic. It does not get iso uh, affected by uh, the traffic of other service types or other types of requests like notifications or uh, like customer profiling. All this is isolated from the new order management system. So we were able to, uh, like this smart proxy enab now enables us to keep uh, migrating each service to new backends. This time we migrated transport, but now we already have the ability to do this phase migration for our food service and maybe transport service, ne uh, uh, sorry, uh, delivery service next. Uh, and we are able to do it in a phased approach, uh, which helps us to not cause any downtime to the huge user base who are using our app. And uh, like the migration to microservices is becoming seamless because of this. Also, it's easier to ice, uh, iterate over this dedicated system because uh, now you're just focused with the features of that particular service and you're able to QA it more effectively. Uh, you're able to choose a customized tech stack for this new system, which is like a uh, given advantage with microservices. And also the issues are isolated. So because of one bug sitting in an irrelevant logic to the OMS, the OMS itself doesn't come down, so customers don't get affected. So, uh, like, uh, this is how uh, we are able to migrate now to microservices, and uh, the smart proxy in Golang really kept up with the huge amount of traffic, and, uh, like, it gave us a pretty good performance, and it is uh, still helping us now uh, with new migration, and it's not actually, it, never has any production issues uh, touch wood till now. And like so much so that uh, some people don't even know that it exists in the system because it never creates any issues and the whole transfer is seamless from uh, one backend to the other. So yeah. Do you guys have any questions? All right. Okay, let's take a few questions, please. Uh, who is taking the questions? Could you just stand up because there's a lot of light? Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, regarding the testing. Right. Get the mic, please. Um, yeah, so regarding the testing where you said you were incrementally increasing the traffic that was being sent, right. uh, do you have any plans of uh, automating that in the future? <laughs> so I was thinking something like record all traffic from the past or like for a few days and then like play that, that kind of a load. So that's basically you're saying load testing, right? Yeah. Like that's what you do during load testing. Right. So yeah, sure, like you can do load testing on a load testing environment test out the performance and stuff, but when you're actually going to production, you can still not s switch the whole traffic, right? I mean, there might be something that might be missed in load testing. For example, 
if you're doing load testing on that new piece of backend itself, you wouldn't have known that uh, the internal calls to this old monolith would have failed. Probably you would have to set up like a whole integrated environment for that load testing. Right. So even if you're happy with the load testing, there's no harm in like switching the traffic on uh, a phased approach, right? Right. It, just to be safe. And yeah. it did help us at one point of time. Yeah. Hi, Aditya. Oh, yeah. Hi. Nice talk. Nice talk. Thank you. So I have a, a small uh, question related to the load of uh, how is this smart proxy memory and CPU profile different or uh, different from HA proxy? Like how much more uh, resources does it need? And it actually uh, uh, doesn't need much resources. Like right now the whole traffic that we have is just two app boxes for the smart proxy, which is probably equal to the number of HA proxy app boxes that we have. So it might be faster, as fast as the HA proxy. Okay, and all the smartness of the system is maintained in configuration, not as DB calls, right? Yeah, everything is in Viper configuration. Okay, thanks. All right, I have time for, I'm sorry, I have time for only one last question. Yes. And I have somebody waving frantically right in the back. So let's do that. Hello. Hi. Uh, did you at any juncture face a challenge uh, of communicating between microservices? Yes. And yeah. if you face, apart from using the same proxy, did you use any other mechanism? Yeah, so we are still facing that issue with uh, microservices. It's a different kind of issue with the internal uh, system, which would come up anytime when we are go you're going with a new microservice architecture. So now we are moving towards a Kafka-based approach uh, instead of for uh, making uh, like the data synchronized without making HTTP synchronous calls. So one approach is the Kafka approach, with, which happens in async, and also we are using Sidekick for uh, other kind of async processing. So I think the answer is to move as much as possible to asynchronous, uh, as long as it's not a business requirement. For example, if you want immediate payment results, you'd still have to have that synchronous. and. Uh, for synchronous calls, what we are doing is uh, we have circuit openers now uh, using Hystrix. So we are able to uh, stop any cascading effects if one of our service has an outage. But is it among the microservices? Uh, what is among the microservices? I mean, the communication happens that you just mentioned. Is it happening among the microservices or with just a uh, smart proxy? No, it's happening among the micro. So okay. not every communication happens to the smart proxy. We have internal channels also. Right. One is the Kafka channels that we have, mm -hmm. uh, the sidekick channels, the HTTP calls with the services make directly to each other. Okay. Right. Okay, I know there are a lot more questions that are there, but we hold that for now, otherwise we get delayed for lunch. So thank right. you so much, Aditya.